Good evening. Welcome to the 26th annual Environmental Film Festival. We're thrilled to have you with us tonight. We have an incredible film for you tonight. I'm so excited about this one. It is a DC premiere of this film. It is amazing. It is called Ocean Warriors Chasing the Thunder. We're very fortunate to have the filmmakers and some very special guests here with us this evening. They're going to be on stage to answer your questions after the film. Place them under arrest. All right, that's great, Peter. I'm going to try and cover this ground to get to that fishing gear. OK, thanks, Sid. So he's got the thunder. Yes. We'll get a distance on how far we have to go, but I guess that'll be our first mission to haul in that gear. impressive team of people to the stage. Paul Watson, the founder of Sea Shepherd, and so many other things. <laughs> and you can tell us more. Mark Benjamin and Mark Levin were executive producers and directors of the film. Good job, guys. <laughs> and Peter Hammerstadt, who I think needs no introduction. He was the captain of the Bob Barker. And, um, but before we get underway, may I ask, how many Sea Shepherds are here in the audience? Wow! Well done, guys! <laughs> Great going. <laughs> well, Peter, people asked me two questions about you and your experience. You look so cool under pressure, you're so courageous, you never even blink, well, maybe once or twice. But everybody always asks, what was the worst, hardest moment for you, and what was the best? Well, the most difficult part of the mission was the uncertainty, not knowing how long this chase would last. And I remember about 60 days into pursuing the thunder, my chief engineer, Irwin, came up to the bridge with the fuel figures for that day. Oh. Um, we had about 370,000 liters of fuel on board. Uh, we were burning about 500 liters a day because we were just running on the generator, drifting with the thunder. And of course, I made that quick calculation that if the thunder drifted indefinitely, then we could be out at sea for over two years. Huh. So I went down to the mess and I, I, I grabbed my chief cook, Priya, and I asked her, Priya, do we have enough food to stay out at sea for two years. And she replied, we have enough rice and beans to survive at sea for two years. <laughs> uh, I got, gathered my crew together and I told them that this was the situation. We could potentially be out for two years. Would they be willing to stay? There was the opportunity of the Sam Simon going to, the Mauritius, to Mauritius to drop off the evidence. And out of 30 crew, 26 decided to stay on board the Bob Barker, knowing that we could be out at sea for two years. That was incredibly inspiring for me. So the hardest moment was also the best. That's incredible. Now let me ask you, how many years have you been with Sea Shepherd? I joined Sea Shepherd when I was 18 years old, when I first sailed under, under Paul's command, and that was 15 years ago. And if you had to encapsulate it in, you know, a sentence, why do you do it? Well, the reason that I'm involved in Sea Shepherd is that Sea Shepherd delivers such direct results. There's a lot of different NGOs out in the world doing marine conservation, but the results are so direct. Uh, sea Shepherd doesn't measure success by the number of glossy reports that we put out every year because we don't put out any. We don't measure our success by our membership. We have a small but very passionate and dedicated membership. We measure our success by two things, and that's the number of lives that we're able to save at sea, the number of criminal operations that we're able to shut down. Wow, that is, it's so great to have you here. Thanks for traveling all this way. Um, Mark Levin, you've made a lot of films. You've worked for HBO, for every network, for you've produced theatrical films. What grabbed you about this story and what got you involved? 
Well, I really feel more like an audience member. I'm up here. I want to thank uh, Peter, you, and Paul. I mean, um, and my partner, Mark Benjamin, who I've spent years making films uh, about social justice, economic justice, and racial justice. And I must say, it's Mark that really brought me into the field of environmental justice. And uh, I'm here more to thank him and what Sea Shepherd does. I was moved the moment I, I said to Peter, uh, outside, I feel like uh, I'm meeting a movie star. I was in the editing room for months and months looking at this footage, amazed by the uh, dedication of uh, the Sea Shepherd volunteers and uh, what they're willing to do. So for me, this was a, a learning experience. Uh, and one that has kind of changed the direction of my career, and I want to thank both of you very much. The ocean sucked you in, and now we're never going to let you leave. Um, Paul Watson, it's such an honor to have you here. Uh, this was, like, was this really the most crazy, dramatic, out-of-control, epic journey that your group, group has been involved with, or maybe not? How would you describe it? <laughs> We've had a lot of them, <laughs> so uh, you know we've been doing this for 40 years, and in the, that time uh, we've had encounters with whaling ships and sealing vessels and illegal fishing vessels, and quite a few of them actually ended in going to the bottom. Um, so this wasn't the first there, but uh, but uh, the, the campaigns. How are many dramatic. ships have you sunk? <sighs> I ran the Pirate of Sierra off the coast of Portugal in 79 and disabled its crew. We sank it later. Uh, then we sank two ships in uh, Spain uh, that were illegally fishing and a couple more in Norway. Uh, but <laughs> a few. But they were all criminals. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they, they might dispute that. But the fact is, is that uh, the most important thing about Sea Shepherd is that in 40 years of operations, we've never caused a single injury to a single person. And that's the record we're most proud of. That's true, guys. So right now we have we have 12 ships, and uh, at this moment there's about 175 people uh, from about 25 different countries on those ships, all very dedicated and passionate volunteers. And that's what is the strength of Sea Shepherd: those passionate volunteers. We sometimes get criticized that you know our crew are not professionals, and uh, I'm very thankful that they're not because I couldn't pay professionals to do what these volunteers do for for nothing. <laughs> As uh, Ernest Shackleton said in, in 1911, when the, the London Times criticized him for having amateur crews, he says, I, I don't want professionals. I need people who have the passion to get me where I need to go. I can't do that with professionals. And that's, I, I picked up on that, and that's what we've been cultivating over these years. And it seems to be working. Well, speaking of passion and a little bit of insanity, Mark Benjamin. You have been working on ocean issues for so long. You are so persistent. Some have said you're relentless. Why do you care so much about this issue and have made so many films about it and will never stop? I didn't uh, get into conservation until about four years ago, and I've been a filmmaker for 45 years. Uh, I, I just first want to thank Katie, because Katie was the producer we did a series called Ocean Warriors, six hours for Discovery, and Vulcan distributed it in 50 countries. And Katie was the producer on that. And then she came up with this idea. I think it was, uh, she kept pushing me, let's, let's extract the feature film from the series. We didn't know if Animal Planet would go for it or Discovery or Vulcan, but we just we, we proceeded. And this, it's all history now. And you, you've, you're a great audience, and you've seen what, what came out of it. And, and never forget, I mean, of course, Peter chased the thunder for 110 days, but Paul Watson was like a father you know, to Peter over all these years. And Paul Watson put the ships in the water you know, with Sid and, and Peter. So it's, it's really the vision, this 40 year of uh, unrelenting you know, care for marine species and mammal, marine mammals. So Paul's really a, a major hero in, in my life. And in, in the rear of the room, there's a producer, Sam. Stand up, wave to us, Sam. He, he, he spent, this man spent almost 100 days on the Thunder filming, and he produced the 12 unit uh, media crew six filmmakers on, on the Sam, six on the Bob, you know, working, w crews working with Sid, crews working with uh, Peter. And I uh, 
like Mark Levin and I have been making films together for 40 years. <clears throat> we, we made a film in Washington a long time ago called Slam. It, it was at the DC jail. It won the grand jury prize at Sundance and it won the camera door. So we're very happy to be back in Washington sitting, <laughs> sitting next to Paul and Peter. I couldn't be happier. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all you do for this. Oh my gosh. For all of us. We, we had... We had dozens of people on the production team working all over the world for almost two years. And Mark Benjamin was the guy in the office, you know, midnight on a Saturday night going, whoa, where's the Tanzania crew? They haven't called in on WhatsApp. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, and I also should say thanks to Vulcan, who are, you know, one of our key funders, and they're supporting us going forward on our next film as well. Um, they've been tireless in their support of, of ocean conservation, too. So we're, we're very, we, we feel it's a privilege. It's hard work, but it's a privilege to be in the middle of, of, this, uh, of this juncture in ocean conservation. Now, I'm going to ask Peter one more question, and then I'm going to toss it to the audience. Peter, are you going to do it again? And if so, where? Well, one of the great advantages of this campaign was that we started with chasing six ships. We just happened to find the most notorious of those six being the Thunder. But because of the attention that the chase received, governments from Australia to New Zealand to South Africa to Indonesia were, were forced to intervene and put in incredible resources to catch the other five vessels. And so after the chase of the Thunder ended, uh, about a year Going, going after that, we saw all six of the bandit six vessels, as we call them, that were plundering the Antarctic, brought to justice all around the globe. Wow. <laughs> so where are you going next, and do you need any volunteers? And that's to both of you. Paul. Well, I just wanted to mention one thing that you, you didn't mention, is that two of those vessels uh, were in Cape Verde uh, and hiding out. And... Um, Peter happened to be going to Cape Verde just to check on one of our vessels that was there. And as he left the airport and he was driving towards the boat, he saw them in the harbor and reported them to Interpol. So how, that's how those were caught. <laughs> That's really, you guys are so amazing. I'm going to throw it out to the audience because I know that there's going to be some curiosity about what's happening with this crew. Any questions? Yes. I was surprised that there wasn't there weren't weapons used. Why wasn't the, why didn't why didn't the crew fight back and shoot? <laughs> Good idea. Why not, Peter? Uh, which crew do you mean? <laughs> the bad guys. I think one answer to that is they've been down there for a, over a decade. Nobody's ever bothered them. They never had any cause to, uh, to, to have to defend themselves. Uh, that would be one reason. And, and another reason is that too often fisheries crimes are seen as administrative offenses. So they don't, they don't really fear any major repercussions against their criminal enterprises. It's in recent years, thanks to Sea Shepherd, thanks to the efforts of Interpol, that illegal fishing vessels are being pursued using every avenue. And so if you're committing an illegal fishing offense, not only are you fishing without a license, like in the example of the Thunder, but you're also going to be doing customs violations, you'll be doing tax fraud, you'll be forging documents. And, and the new strategy has been to go up against illegal fishing businesses through, through with the whole gamut of the law in our favor. Sort of like the Al Capone strategy. Al Capone was suspected of dozens of murders. The FBI couldn't get him on a single thing until they were able to put him in Alcatraz for, for tax evasion. And so now that there is a more political will around the, around the world to tackle these businesses as criminal enterprises, as transnational organized crime, we may see more violence from them. Yes, right there in the middle. Hold on one sec, of, um, microphone's coming your way. Thank you. How much does this cost and who pays for it? The enforcement or the TV production? Uh, no, the whole Sea Shepherd operation. Oh, and by the ooh. way, one of my really good vegan friends back in Michigan has cats named Watson and Shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Well, it does cost a lot. I, owning one vessel, they say, is like standing under a cold shower dropping $100 bills down the drain continuously. So we have 12 of them. Uh, those big ships are about 50000 a month, I think, to, 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 to run them. Uh, and, of course, the biggest cost is fuel, which is extremely expensive. I think our budget's about $12 million a year. It's around that. But when you consider that, that uh, you know, just to compare it, Greenpeace has a budget of 450 million euros a year, and they have three ships. We have a budget of 12 million a year with uh, for the 12 ships. So uh, it's not money that is important. What's important is the passion and the courage of these crews, and that's what, that's really what drives these uh, these vessels. And the willingness to eat a lot of rice and beans. No. <laughs> all, all, all Sea Shepherd vessels are vegan vessels, by the way, and have been. <laughs> have been for 18 years, I, I, I gather. That, and the reason for that is that we're simply, we're eating the oceans alive. And uh, even when you eat a hamburger, you're eating fish because 40% of all of the fish taken out of the ocean is fed to, uh, to livestock. And so, you know, if, at this rate, we're going to run out of fish by 2048, according to some of the, the uh, scientists who are responsible for that. And we need to find a solution to that. I did have a solution that I, went, I gave to COP21 in Paris at that meeting, but nobody was interested in it. And the solution is simple. You know, we leave it alone. We do nothing. For 50 years, don't touch the ocean. Stop all this commercial fishing, the heavy gear fishing, and let the ocean repair itself. For hundreds of years, shamans in uh, to Polynesia would say, no fishing in this bay. It is kapu. 20 years, no fishing. Anybody caught fishing got the death penalty. And everybody said, well, that's a little extreme. No, because the Polynesians realized that if the fish died, they died. And that's our situation right now. If this ocean dies, we all die. Yes, there's a question right there. Hold on one sec, here comes the mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, yeah, but some people in the back. My apologies. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, how do you... <laughs> now we can't hear you. Hello, hello. There we go. Um, how do you recruit your crew, and what is the process through which you choose the crew that you have on the vessels? Are you available? Okay. <laughs> no, the crew. I, I would seriously consider it. The crew are volunteers from all over the world. Like I said, there's about 25 different nations right now represented, and people send in uh, applications to crew. They, they they volunteer, and to er, er, from all different walks of life. Anybody, anybody in this room can volunteer, and that. Uh, it used to be in the early days. It was difficult getting crew. Now the most difficult thing is having to say no to so many people because we just simply don't have the room. But we try to accommodate as many people as we possibly can. What are we looking for? Courage, passion, and uh, just persistence and stubbornness. Uh, the people who, who get on the crew are the people who keep bugging us. Uh, <laughs> you know, just handing in the application uh, doesn't get you as far as if you're constantly being persistent. But uh, very, very proud of, uh, of our crew. Uh, and uh, what's more important is that crew members come on board and understand that they can make a difference, that they can change the world. It's an empowering sort of experience. So many of our crew have gone on to uh, start other organizations and get involved in other issues and do other things. And so we're just reaching out. And, and to me, the strength of, a, of any movement has to be in diversity, just like the strength of any ecosystem is in diversity. So we like to contribute to that diversity and to empower as many people as possible. Mark Benjamin, would you do it? I'd rather make films. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> the, thing, the thing that I think a lot of you know is that there's a, like $140 billion fishing industry and about $100 billion of it is so-called legal and the f other 40 is so-called IUU or illegal fishing. The, the big problem for the future of the ocean is, is not the illegal, it's the industrial legal fishing. And until the ocean, you know, as Paul pointed out, you know, gets a break and gets to rejuvenate, because we've been fishing it down so hard. Paul mentioned 2048, that's a number that's been kicking around that will be the date of the end of ma major industrial fishing, because the collapse of so many plate fish species will have disappeared. So the question is, is will the political will, and the, will it be legislated, whether it's the UN or whatever body, to control industrial fishing? And when we started our six-hour series, 
we were told that it's called Ocean Warriors and it's about illegal fishing. And we, you know, Mark, Katie, our whole team kept telling Discovery and Vulcan, well, let us do industrial fishing. Let's go after them too because they're, they're a bigger problem. But we, we, couldn't, we couldn't get the sign off. And I, I can say today that uh, thanks to Ocean Warriors and Chasing the Thunder and the successes for Vulcan, Vulcan has come back to our company, Brick City TV. It's Mark Levin and I are partners in this company. And Katie will be a producer on it. And we're going to make a, a, a new feature documentary about the ocean. And they're allowing us this time to include destructive industrial fishing. So this is a major hurdle, a major hurdle. Here, Mark. Uh, I want to just pick up on what Paul said about empowering people, and you asked about volunteering, because really, uh, given the dysfunction that you all know happening right here around the corner, uh, we can't look uh, to others. It is all about uh, people who do have the passion, uh, the courage, uh, to make a difference. And that, I, I've seen this film so many times, but sitting in the back, again, I was moved because with the young people who are out now on the gun issue, uh, seeing the volunteers, it's gonna take, this, this is where the change is gonna come from. Uh, and that is really what inspired me working on this, continues to inspire me, is the stories because there's a kind of a classic stereotype, which is if you wanna make the world better, you're some kind of tree hugger that's boring and didactic and nobody's interested and who will watch. Uh, and I sat there gripped knowing what would happen in each one of these major dramas uh, and just wondering if I would have the courage as that young woman had in the boat waiting you know, to get back on after she had been exposed to the freezing waters down in the Arctic, uh, numbed. Uh, and there are so many people who are willing to put their lives on the line to make a difference. Those are the stories that Mark and I want to tell and Katie. Uh, and this has only inspired me to do it even more. Thank you. Yes, right here in the blue. Hey, thank you. Um, I was curious as to what new technology is out there to improve the monitoring of the oceans. There's quite a lot of technology out there now that improves uh, law enforcement abilities at sea. Uh, one of them, of course, is AIS technology. So vessels over a certain tonnage need to have a transponder on board that sends their position out to, to the world. And so you can go online, anybody can go online, and you can see what tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of vessels are doing at any one time. But then, of course, if you're doing something illegal like the Thunder is doing, you simply turn off your transponder. Um, there's satellite technology, and there's, that's being increasingly used, and it's cheaper to buy even commercial satellite imagery now. But again, it's not real time. There's always a bit of a delay in it. And what all these technology groups are not providing is the at-sea asset to actually go out and interdict in crimes. Uh, one of the big focuses of, of Sea Shepherd at the moment is, is working on stopping illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing by working with governments whose economic resources are stretched where they can't cover their sea areas. Maybe they don't have a ship of their own. And so currently we have a vessel in Tanzania, we have a vessel in Liberia, and those Sea Shepherd vessels are working with law enforcement from those countries to, to arrest ships. And then if you combine AIS, satellite imagery, with actual boots on the ground or boots on the deck, then you can make a really, really big difference. So I think Technology complements traditional law enforcement means. It's not the solution in and of itself. And I think too often we rely on solution to solve our problems. Technology can help us, but we also have to remember that technology helps the poachers as well. One of the reasons that the oceans are in such a crisis is because of GPS and sonar, which are military technologies that have been moved to the civilian sector and now ensure that marine wildlife has no place to hide at all. 
Yeah, I just want to add that. Peter set up uh, our operations on East and West Africa uh, since um, the, uh, that ca the Thunder campaign. And what we, we have these working uh, partnerships with uh, Liberia, Gabon, uh, with uh, Tanzania, and that's growing more. So now we're actually getting countries to come to us and are asking us for our support. So we're also in partnership with Mexico. Uh, we've been asked to partner with Peru and uh, with Chile, and we've been in a partnership with Ecuador for 20 years. So uh, this, I think, is the real uh, way to go, uh, that we can provide resources and um, initiative, I guess, and they provide the enforcement. And it's really making a difference. Right now, we have three vessels in the Sea of Cortez uh, working to uh, protect the endangered Baquita from poachers. We've uh, confiscated. <laughs> we've, uh, we, we've confiscated 15,000 meters of gill nets, uh, illegal gill nets from the Vaquita Refuge. That's twice as, as high as Mount Everest. And uh, that's actually increasingly becoming a, a dangerous campaign. They've shot down two of our drones. They tried to throw a Molotov cocktail on it, but uh, it burned the guy's hand and it only went two feet. But, uh, but, uh, but now we have Mexican uh, sailors on board with us, so that's giving us the security we need to continue to do that. So every day, crew members are pulling, pulling nets. And uh, if we can get those nets out there, we can protect that refuge. Fantastic. Um, this has to be our last question right there, but we're gonna be up here afterwards. If you have anything else you'd like to ask anybody uh, here, come right on up to the stage. Uh, yes, your question. Um, I'm 16. Uh, how old do you have to be to volunteer? Uh, 18, uh, unless you have a, a letter from your parents. Uh, <laughs> but the, the oldest crew member we've taken on was 86. Wow, so it's not too late for all of us. All right, we can squeeze in one more question. Yes, right here. Sorry, all right. Oops. That was a nice short one, thank you. Hi, I was just curious, with so many emergencies, how do you prioritize? What's your strategy? Do you go with government support or the largest emergency? Or? What was really good about the Thunder case is, as the Thunder sank, I remember wondering why, out of all the places they could have sunk this ship, why did they sink it 80 miles off of Sao Tome? They could have sank it anywhere. And then as I went to Sao Tome, I learned that they have a few small boats, but their Coast Guard can't get more than 20 miles off the coast. So the, thunder, the captain of the Thunder, Cataldo, uh, sank his vessel there knowing that nobody was going to get out there to save his ship. No Coast Guard or Navy was going to put submersible pumps on board and keep that vessel afloat. And the same reason that the captain of the Thunder decided to sink his ship in Sao Tome is the same reason that the Gulf of Guinea is so wrought with maritime security issues from illegal fishing to narcotics trafficking. All of it is because there's a law enforcement vacuum that exists there. That led to thinking that, okay, the oceans are massive. But I learned a lot about fishing during the chase of the thunder. There was a lot of time to, to, to read. And I think a lot of people think that you can just go out to sea and catch fish, but you, you can't. 90% of the world's fish are actually caught in the waters of some country. And that's because fish congregate on continental shelves and sea mounts and shoals. Now, if you look at the fact that 15 to 40% of the global catch of fish is caught through IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, 15 to 40% is IUU, 90% is caught in the waters of some country, then we have to work with governments whose economic resources are stretched. And part of that strategy as to which governments we work with depends in identifying key areas of biodiversity, places where we can take a stand, where we can draw our battle lines, where we don't back down. And I know that Paul identified the Galapagos Islands as one of those places 15 years ago. And now we're spreading that footprint to, to other places in the world as well. I would just like to add that uh, to Paul Allen's credit, who, who he, he runs Vulcan, he was the co-founder of Microsoft with Bill Gates. To his credit, he told us, w when you get this series done, get me a big fish, a bad guy. And I was influenced uh, by Paul uh, to end the film with the arrest of Antonio Vidal Suarez, who's notorious for at least two decades of being one of the world's greatest gangster poachers from Galicia, Spain. So, you know, I don't think we took any major risk because Robert Redford and Paul Allen were our executive producers. We didn't feel threatened by retribution. But we did put them on the screen to try to, uh, you know, make a sign to the world. We don't care how big a gangster you are. 
if, if, they're, if crooked courts won't lock you up, filmmakers will put your face on, on television and on screens around the world, and illegal fishing can't go on forever. And, and captains like this and the young captain, Peter, with them and people fighting against illegal fishing, I think we're going to keep going after it. I hope this film sets an example to filmmakers that you can go after the big fish, the big dog. There's nobody outside the law. So we did put them up there, and none of us have been firebombed. And uh, <laughs> to, to Paul Allen's credit, he, he gave us permission to go after that gangster. Yeah, I just want to add one last thing, you know, for decades and decades, Sea Shepherd operated as uh, we were looked down upon, uh, you know, radical, extremists, uh, you know, called as eco-terrorists, even though I never worked for Monsanto. But uh, they, um, <laughs> but all those years we had to endure that, but, and we continued to do what we did because we thought this was the right thing to do. And I never, ever thought I would see the day that what happened after the thunder is the Secretary of State for the United States, John Kerry, saying on the front page of the New York Times, thank God for Sea Shepherd. Never thought I'd see that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Mark Levin, Mark Benjamin, Peter Hammerstadt, and Paul Watson. So glad you have you here. And uh, come on up and talk to this group if you'd like to afterwards.